All right, um, on to the final session for the afternoon. Uh, and the final perspective of the future is coming to us from uh, the journal editor perspective. So editors play a critically important human in the loop role in the process of getting ideas vetted and distributed out into the community. Uh, a few weeks ago, I wrote in the Scully Kitchen an article about garbage reduction and how it's becoming increasingly important in a world where it's ever easier for people to generate content. Um, and editors play a Im critically important role in vetting and reviewing and <laughs> assessing papers submitted for their quality as well as their fit for a journal community. Um, I expect as much as we hope that machines will be the saviors and will reduce us from the very hard work that is re involved in reviewing um, and, and assessing the quality of content, my expectation is that human knowledge and human judgment will always play a very vital role in that process. And the editor is singular in that ecosystem. So to provide this perspective, I'm pleased to welcome uh, Darren Robler. So, so interested to hear what you have to say. Darren, over to you. It's a privilege to be the final speaker today. Uh, and thank you very much to the conference organizers for having me. I also realize I'm the one keeping you from drinks, so I promise not to go over time. So I'm going to give you my perspective. Based on the editor-in-chief, I'm speaking from my perspective in that role as well as my academic role. I am going to be giving you predictions now because predicting the future is so difficult and fraught. Put some uncertainty bars on there, large ones, but here we go. So here's the outline for my talk today. I'm going to first start with an overview of the new journal. I'm going to tell you about some of the innovative things I think we're doing. Then I'm going to tell you about, at the end, what I think the journal will look like 10 years from now, in 2034, as well as some thoughts about scientific publishing in general. And then in the middle of that, I'm going to talk about Emerging trends, including AI and open data. I know we've talked about that a lot today, but get used to it, right? Because these are the things that are driving change in the community. So biophotonics discovery. Uh, SBIE chose me as their editor-in-chief for this new journal last year. And since then, I've put together an editorial board. Uh, we're going to have our first issue, hopefully in a month or two from now. And the purpose for this journal was to cover a hole in the publishing landscape not currently covered by SBIE. So my field is in biophotonics, so that means using light to measure tissue and cells, biological things. So this community started maybe 50 years ago, and it was started by mostly physicists, some chemists, and as it's matured, there's been more people like me, biomedical engineers, more biologists, more MDs coming into the community. And we're taking these tools and applying them and making discoveries in biology and translational medicine. And prior journals in the field, like the Journal of Biomedical Optics and Journal of Medical Imaging, fantastic, I publish in them, but they're focused more on devices and methods. So we needed a place to publish the discoveries we were making. And I love this quote from Sidney Brenner, it's a, a Nobel Prize winner. Progress in science depends on new techniques, new discoveries, and new ideas, probably in that order. So I think our community has done a great job of developing the techniques and the methods. Now we're using them for the next step to try to make these discoveries. So here's our scope. We want this journal to be the premier venue to highlight the realized potential in, of novel and emerging biophotonic technologies and their impacts on basic and clinical science and medicine. So some of our differentiating factors include the focus on discovery. We also have some um, editorial policies and differences in our editorial board I'll go over in just a moment. We have a connection to a large, the largest conference in our field that's called SBIE Photonics West. And we also have a, a fairly, I think, progressive data policy. So here's the editorial board. Um, I'm the editor in chief. So I have a lab at Boston University. Here's my lab in the background. We call it the Biomedical Optical Technologies Lab. So we develop a certain class of biophotonic technologies. They're called diffuse optical technologies, but this includes things like wearables and handheld probes that use light to measure tissue. We have clinical studies going on in breast cancer and cardiovascular disease, kidney disease, rheumatologic diseases, and others. First thing I did was put together a senior advisory board. Okay, so these are some of the most respected people in our field. 
They include the current and former SBIE presidents, Anita and Jennifer. They include editors and chiefs of other SBIE journals. They include the director of an institute of the NIH, Bruce Tromberg, who heads the NIBIB. And they've really provided me a lot of feedback on policy and direction for the journal. Totally important to get others on board. Here's my deputy editors. They're really my lieutenants. They help me handle a lot of the workload and they're fantastic. They're at an earlier career stage because senior researchers just don't have the time to put in the help that you need. Here's the associate editors. So they cover a huge geographic diversity and diversity in scientific scope. One thing I wanna point out here is one of our policies is the term limits. So these associate editors, along with the other editors, including myself, all have term limits. So for the associate editor, it's an initial term of three years, and that can be renewed up to three years, and then we're done, right? So the idea for this journal was not to just publish great science and technology, but also to make it an engine to get more investigators in our field involved in publishing. And so to do that, we're gonna make new slots for them in the future. We have an early career editorial board. Here are their names. They're, again, fantastic group. They're typically instructors and postdocs who we think are gonna be the next associate editors. And importantly, they all also serve as a peer review pool for the journal, right? So this helps us solve one of the major problems that an editor in chief has, and it's getting people to review papers and to do it well. And so they are really helping us with that. And although the journal is new, we'll see, I think they're gonna do a great job and do faster than only trying to find reviewers out in the wild. And then finally, we have the last part, that's the BIOS Advisory Board is what we call it. So this is our link or one of our links to the major conference in our field called SBIE Photonics West. This occurs every February in San Francisco, so for 24,000 attendees. And a portion of this conference is related to biophotonic technologies. And so this part of the editorial board are basically the conference chairs of the different sub-conferences at Photonics West. And what we're doing is using them to help us identify what are the emerging trends they're seeing during the conference? Who are the people we should be asking for special sections or inviting for papers or reviews, right? So that's how we're staying connected to our physical community. And I really like that. So that's our editorial board. We also have a data policy that requires everyone who submits a paper to upload data, right? So we're trying to lead the way within the SBIE community. We think that everybody's gonna be doing this in the next few years, but we're doing it now and we're experimenting with it. So you can upload all the data you want. We give authors 450 megabytes, many cases that won't be enough. So you have to use an external repository, but we're saying at a minimum, give us your minimal data set. And this is a term that's borrowed from PLOS publishing, but that means things like the values behind the mean standard deviations and other measures reported, the values within the plots you show, and points extracted from images for analysis. So I'll give you an example. This is a, a subset of figures from a paper that my lab's working on. We're gonna publish it in the journal, hopefully, if we can get past peer review. And what you're looking at is uh, we image people before and after either a high fat or a low fat meal, then we measure how their tissue optical properties change. Okay, the conclusion is you change a lot, whether you eat a high or low fat meal, and you can measure that optically, which is fascinating. But with that submission, we're just gonna upload an Excel spreadsheet that has all the values you need to reproduce these plots on your own. And this may sound like a small thing, but it is a sea change in our community, and I, and I think many publishing communities. Can't tell you the number of times I wish I could get the data off of a plot from a paper in our field. And often the authors don't respond, they're dead, other problems like that. So here, <laughs> we're gonna have access to the data. And this is gonna provide a number of opportunities, including for things like meta-analyses, which I think we're gonna see more of. I'll talk about that in a few slides. But also, of course, this encourages rigor. When you're forced to upload the data, you're gonna take a look at it, make sure, because you know other eyes are gonna be on it. So I think it's a good thing, but we're currently training our community. We have to have kind of a conversation with most of the people that are submitting papers about this. Okay, so there's a snapshot of the journal. So let's go on and look at emerging trends in scientific publishing. And of course, I'm gonna start with AI. And so I've heard a lot of these same ideas and trends talked about earlier in the conference, which has been fantastic. I hope I can provide maybe a different opinion in some ways, or maybe a little bit of different data. 
But if not, sorry. So one question you could ask is how common is AI? And typically we're talking about generative AI and publishing currently. And maybe the best data we have is from a, a nature survey of 1,600 researchers. It was published September in 2023, so it's already out of date. But in this survey, they found that 30% of the people who responded to the survey currently use generative AI to write papers, and 15% use it for peer review. Okay, so these numbers have probably gone up. Now, we can ask whether this is good or bad, but as an editor-in-chief, I want to know, can I detect this? Can I see this in the papers we get and in the peer reviews we get? And I think the answer to that is mostly no, and it'll probably be increasingly no. So the studies out there have shown that most of the AI detectors, as well as human experts, aren't very good at detecting text that's been altered on an individual basis or an individual document. However, when we look at many, many documents together, we can sometimes see trends that you can't see in individual documents. So this is a, a paper that's gotten a lot of attention recently. It's on the archive. I don't know if you've seen it or not, but it's quite interesting. So they looked at 146,000 peer reviews. So this is for uh, AI conferences. So in AI conferences, you submit an abstract. They're peer reviewed. Not everybody gets to present. And this is a study of the peer reviews. Okay, so in those 146,000 peer reviews, they looked over time from 2020 up to 2024, and they had a, an AI model, machine learning model that could identify telltale signs of whether large language models had been used. And what they found is after the release of ChatGPT in November 30th, 2022, there was an increase in, for example, some flowery adjectives in these reviews. Things like commendable, innovative, meticulous. And I've noticed this myself. I don't know you, if you have, but a lot of these chatbots have a positivity bias. They really want to tell you happy things. So they found that up to about 17% of these peer review reports were substantially modified by chatbots. And they also found that the closer you got to the deadline for the peer review, the more likely a chatbot was used, which is maybe not surprising. So one of the lead authors says, it seems like when people have a lack of time, they tend to use ChatGPT. So this is for the AI community, AI researchers. When they did the same thing on Nature publications, they didn't see the same thing. So probably lagging in the more general scientific community, but I think we can still say, you know, people are using generative AI and large language models for peer review and for writing papers, and this trend is on the rise. So what are the policies for this? Places like Nature and Science generally say no generative AI in peer review. SBAE has a, a bit more subtle policy, and I was part of the conversation when we came up with this. So the idea here is you want to protect the confidentiality of authors. However, I think that the developers, places like OpenAI, know that confidentiality is going to be key to their business models. So they're starting to release enterprise versions. There's even standalone versions that you can download. So if you can guarantee privacy, which is difficult and we shouldn't trust them, but then you can use generative AI and you should tell us about it. Now, in terms of authorships, many journals allow generative AI and large language models. You just need to disclose. And publishing groups like ICMJE have uh, updated their policies recently to allow or to suggest that these types of practices should be allowed. Now, where can this go wrong? It's kind of funny to see the sad ways people use generative AI. So let's do that. So here is a figure from a manuscript that was recently retracted in a Frontiers journal. And at first glance, it's a colorful, what's called signal transduction pathway. It's the JAKSTAT pathway. And one doesn't need to look at it for very long to see that the text on the outside of it is completely meaningless in any language, right? And this is by far not the most egregious example in this paper. The most egregious example is not safe for work. You can look it up on your own time. <laughs> Here's another example sent to me by um, a colleague. And I'm not going to disclose the authors to protect them, but because it hasn't really been in the popular press. But let me read the second to last paragraph of the paper. It says, in summary, the management of bilateral iatrogenic I'm very sorry, but I don't have access to real-time information or patient-specific data as I am an AI language model. 
So this is unfortunate. I think there's more or less generous ways to interpret this, but this is the type of thing that keeps an editor in chief up at night, right? So these are the ways we don't want to use generative AI. So let me summarize for a minute what I think are the risks and opportunities of AI in scientific publishing. The caveats, of course, that this uh, can't be exhaustive. Uh, it's probably impossible to be exhaustive at this point. So risks include lower quality papers and reviews. So the authors of that um, preprint said that we showed that generated texts include less specific feedback or citations of other work in comparison to written reviews, right? And this is a big problem. Just the chatbots at the moment aren't fully aware of the scientific literature. They don't cite it. We also know that LLMs hallucinate citations, right? So this could be a disaster for bibliographies, it's something I'm actually pretty worried about. Output homogenization. The authors also said, generated texts appear to compress the linguistic variation and epistemic diversity as compared to human authors, right? So that's kind of a sad fact. I think a lot of this will get better over time, but that's where we are now. Just using fewer words, sentences are more similar to each other. Bias amplification, this has been covered, but whatever biases there are in the training data, and this can be true on many, many dimensions, are likely going to also appear in whatever the model produces. And accountability issues, are we giving appropriate citation or credit where it's due? There's also enormous opportunities. From the editor-in-chief's perspective, I think that initial screening makes a lot of sense. And you have to be, of course, careful about this, but we can ask questions about how does this fit within the journal scope for a new submission coming through the door? Length, grammar, are there statistics? I don't think this should be the only thing that's done, but it can be an aid to a human. Improvement of language and grammar, right? This is a huge opportunity that can make uh, publishing more accessible to larger parts of the world. The problem with citation accuracy can probably be solved by LLMs, including, in addition to them, you know, causing a problem. Assistance with peer review. I think this is something a lot of people are thinking about. So already I've shown you that humans are using large language models and other generative AI to help them with peer review. Now, how about having a model be reviewer number three in the future? It's increasingly difficult to get peer reviewers. I think publishers have the opportunity to use their huge database of past reviews to train internal models that may be able to provide reviews in the voice of their scientific community, right? One thing that these models are fantastic at is giving you answers in the voice of either specific individuals or classes of individuals. So if you ask a question of ChatGPT and tell it to give you it in the voice of Madame Curie, it's gonna give you a very different answer than if you ask it to give it in the voice of Kim Kardashian. Right, so give us a peer review in the voice of the prior SBIE biophotonics reviewer. It's something we should experiment with. Interactive papers, I'll talk about this a little bit more in a few slides, but how can the paper experience itself change due to AI? And in addition to having the risk of lower quality manuscripts and reviews, I think there's also a chance we'll have much higher quality manuscripts and reviews. Some people think of these AI models as prostheses for thinking, right? And just like any tool, it matters how you use them. There's dumb ways to use them. I think there's much better ways to use them. So if you have a conversation with these models, they can actually get you thinking more deeply about your research, about your science, about your writing. And it all depends on the way these tools are used. Okay, so transitioning to data for a moment, we know that the open, Data movement is important. It started by individuals in the scientific community, but now it's being reinforced by policy. And funders like the NIH and the NSF now have policies that are very new, that are requiring people like me when I submit a grant to basically upload several page, typically two page document for the NIH that specifies where the data should be, is gonna be available, the format of the data, the standards, if you're gonna make any tools, software, codes available, and how long the data will be available. So this is simultaneously exciting and daunting to investigators, right? The opportunities are immense when the data is available to other researchers. However, as an investigator, I'm thinking about how can I do this with the least cost, manpower, and just make my life a little bit easier. So this is another opportunity, I think, for publishers 
to make it easy for people to post their data, maybe to help them visualize data in different ways, readers of the, of the journal, and provide some other value add that goes beyond what we're doing now. There's also a flip side to this. This is quite interesting to me, but so in the past, most attempts to supplement the PDF model have kind of failed to a certain degree. The supplements, some research has shown that people download the supplements or even look at the supplements at a rate that's like 0.04% of the main articles. So there's all this effort potentially going into supplementing the article, and it's not clear if it's being used yet. There's lots of reasons for that. I think, you know, reasons include too many different platforms, types of data, formats. There's just not enough time in the day. Sometimes you just want to know the results of the paper, think about how it'll affect your research. But of course, because it'll solve all problems and cause many others, generative AI will help solve some of this as well. So another thing that generative AI is good at and other AI models is accruing and analyzing data across platforms. Things that can be extremely tedious for humans can be done through LLMs in a way that I think is going to lead to a blooming of a layer on top of the primary literature, and that's meta-analyses. So this was true even before the birth or widely adopted um, availability of large language models. Projects like Neurosynth and NeuroQuery take thousands of papers. They mine the text of these papers. And in the case of Neurosynth, they try to come up with statistical conclusions from the aggregation of all this data. In the case of NeuroQuery, they're trying to make predictions based on these thousands of papers. So if you go to the NeuroQuery website, you can type in Parkinson's or learning, and it's gonna take thousands of papers and show you a simulated fMRI image of where in the brain is associated with whatever you put in the chat, right? So having the data available along with more AI is gonna make more of this possible, um, which is fascinating. And I think a good thing in general. Okay, so there's a, a little bit of a view of the emerging trends as I see them. Now let's look at a view from 2034. So here's what I foresee for my own journal. One thing that I can tell you for sure is 100% of the editorial board will be different then than it is now. <laughs> and that's just due to policy and because I'll get tired. Now, data, all papers will have associated data. We already require that. Many will have code. And more and more people upload more data because of a belief in open data as well as the regulatory aspects. I think we'll solve robust permanent databasing through the journal or partnership with repositories, but this is still a big problem. Many papers will have preprints. The numbers on this vary a lot, but PLOS, for example, published on their website that about 24% of the papers published, published in PLOS journals started as preprints. And so I think preprints will coexist with the traditional publishing model, at least for the foreseeable future. Analytics, this was touched on earlier today, but there's just an emphasis from funders and from institutions to get past impact factor. They wanna know who's reading, what and when, you wanna know that as an author and what impact it's having in the world. And so there's things like alt metrics that are attempting to do this. There's plenty of limitations to it, very difficult to quantify as we heard before, but still important and likely to be a major trend in the next decade. AI. I think for our journal, we're going to allow manuscript writing and reviews with disclosure and proof of confidentiality. Manuscripts will likely be pre-checked with some kind of internal AI. I think our associate editors will see an AI peer review report to supplement the human reports. And we can think about systems where we ask the same questions of every paper, try to be fair. But I think the opportunities here are, are large, right? We can go beyond, peer review has its own problems and many errors aren't found by peer review. Maybe if we supplement peer review, we'll find more errors. Even in things like interpretation, are there alternative interpretations to the data presented? It's an important question. And even as a peer reviewer myself, I'm not always thinking that as at top of mind. Our, all citations will be checked by AI. All papers will be checked for plagiarism by AI. Many publishers are already doing that. Types of manuscripts. I already mentioned that there'll be more meta-analyses. I think that there will be experimentation with our own journal and many others with interactive articles where LLMs and other AI will be built right into the publisher's website. So a few examples of what that could look like, you could have an interactive Q&A session with the uh, paper. 
adaptive content. So think about it this way. Uh, as investigators, we're kind of bad at making our written documents accessible to a large audience. But if you make the highly technical document, LLMs built into the publisher's website might be able to give you different versions at different levels of the same manuscript, maybe a slider bar. Take this all the way down to you want your grandmother, if she's not a scientist, to understand this article, right? All the way up to expert in the subfield. New visualizations of the data, right? So we'll have this data uploaded. What can publishers do to help us look at that data in new ways? Real-time updates, new citations added in real time, enhanced accessibility, real-time translation into different languages. And, uh, you know, I don't work for a publisher per se, but I do think publishers should think about what's the value add, especially in the context of preprint servers. So the more of this you can offer to authors, if it's truly helpful, the better it will be for the business model. Okay, let me really leverage myself now. So here's some scientific uh, or some predictions about scientific publishing in 2034 more generally. I think that journal reputation will become even more valuable than it is now because it'll be a scarcer resource, right? We see trends of anti-globalization or at least fracturing of global globalization. There's kind of an air of anti-institutionalism that's around. And some of that is at least partially deserved, right? We're seeing some of the most impressive investigators and institutions uh, being accused of plagiarism. So we need to protect our reputations in the publishing industry and as editors, and how can we do that? The ways I can think to do that are to know your community. So I think of this sort of similar as to know your customer law and banking. And I think this might be controversial, but what I like about my journals, we're so connected to the community of SPIE because we have a physical conference. There's limitations to that. Not everybody can make it to the conference, but people have their whole careers wrapped up in SPIE, right? That's where their tenure letter writers are going to be. That's where they're getting invited to give talks if you're in my community. So if you commit plagiarism or do something naughty in an SPIE journal, it's going to hurt your entire reputation. It's not just going to prevent you from publishing in that one journal. Assume everything will be scrutinized because it's just going to be so much easier to scrutinize everything that's published. From an editor's perspective, I think we should do less, do it better. This might be publishing less, taking a closer look at everything that goes out the door. Difficult, I know, and in direct conflict with some of the business models of publishing. This was covered earlier, but institutions will begin to alter incentives for tenure and promotion. And that'll affect the publishing landscape. It's very challenging, but there's likely to try to be an impact, uh, focus on impact rather than impact factor or citations. So this is why it's a prediction for 2034. Institutions are very slow to change. I've been on advancement and promotion committees. It's going to take us a long time to steer the ship in even a slightly different direction. But this is a trend that's coming. And of course, AI would be highly integrated into publishing. I think the value of data generation is going to increase relative to text and writing skills, right? So writing is gonna be assisted now by large language models. Data is still very difficult, expensive to produce. Although we've heard about some ways that AI can help with data generation. But in my field where we're trying to measure people with optical technologies, that's still gonna be where the value is. And having that data available, we may be able to interpret it with some of these AI models in a way that will somewhat decrease the value of every written word written by a human. Okay, so I'm gonna leave it there. I'll acknowledge uh, the SBAE staff that's worked with me on this, uh, the editorial board, and I use ChatGPT to help me with some aspects of this presentation. And uh, I'm happy to answer any questions if there's time.